We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about executive presence, and specifically, we're going to talk about three ways that we might be accidentally short-circuiting our executive presence, and I'm going to suggest three uh, principles or strategies that you can use to help you overcome these uh, common uh, you know, short circuits of, of your executive presence. Um, but for starters, I want to talk just for a second about what executive presence is. And when I say, when I use that phrase, um, what I mean um, is the, the leadership sense that you project whenever you are uh, in a room, engaging with other people, um, whenever you're interacting with people. It's kind of that vibe, that energy um, that you are giving off um, that gives people inarticulate cues about what they can expect from you. Um, now, uh, all of us have probably encountered folks who had former formal leadership positions, but who didn't really project strong leadership skills. Um, so they might have been the boss, but they behaved in ways that, that made it likely that folks didn't treat them um, with a level of like respect, deference, um, uh, and, and a willingness to follow that you would hope would come uh, uh, with a leader or with a position. Um, and we've probably similarly also been around a lot of people who didn't necessarily have formal leadership roles, um, but they themselves, you know, behaved in a very uh, leaderly way. Um, they projected confidence, capability, calmness, um, a sense of what to do and when to do it, um, and also maybe seemed, you know, uh, unflappable to a certain extent. It wasn't like they didn't experience uh, difficulty but they knew what to do when they experienced the difficulty. They didn't shut down, they didn't get overwhelmed. Um, and particularly if those people can do all those things, but they can do it in a way that um, keeps them connected to their teams. Uh, even if a person like that doesn't have a formal leadership role, um, they, will, they, they can still have a high degree of executive presence. Um, and that's just another way of saying that people are gonna want those people to be on their team and they're gonna have a tendency to defer to those people um, to trust their judgment, to look to them for direction. Um, and that'll probably also mean that that person has a high ceiling. They've got uh, the ability to grow. So um, one of the things that I think is worth thinking about uh, if you're trying to learn about this topic um, is to think about the role that anxiety plays in the way that we show up as leaders. Um, a great book that I'd recommend on that topic is a book called A Failure of Nerve by Edwin Friedman, which is a phenomenally good book uh, about leadership in general, but it specifically talks about um, the interplay of anxiety uh, with kind of the, the, the calling of leadership. Um, and so part of what I'd encourage you to think about as we talk about these three uh, short circuits and some ways to address them um, is, to, is to think about them in those terms, in terms of uh, how anxiety might be the thing that pushes you um, to the short circuit. Um, because everybody, uh, no matter how strong the leader is, everybody experiences anxiety. And there's a lot of things about anxiety that aren't fun, but anxiety isn't necessarily bad. I mean, anxiety is actually a response that helps us prepare ourselves to uh, neutralize threats or to anticipate and prepare for the future and to do things like that. So anxiety has a positive function. But what we want to be able to do with our anxiety is we want to be able to experience it, process it, and then do something productive with it versus uh, experiencing the anxiety and then desperately trying to get it to dissipate, trying to get rid of it. And one way to think about short circuits in executive presence is um, it's, it, that, that can be a way that a leader can experience anxiety and then can try to like kind of breathe the anxiety out onto their team so that they don't have to contain it anymore. So they, instead of projecting the qualities of a strong leader, the anxious leader who's, who's suffering uh, in the executive presence department projects anxiety instead. So they might, they might get a little bit of the anxiety off their own plate, but they do it by pushing it onto the plate of their others. The irony about that is if you do that, even though for just a second as the leader, your own personal, uh, you know, uh, ownership of or assignment of, of anxiety might go down a little bit in the short run. What happens when the leader gives their anxiety away to their team, very often the cumulative amount of anxiety in the system goes up. And so the leader for a second might feel less anxious, but the team itself becomes more anxious because if my team, if I, if I give my anxiety to my team or to a member of my team, 
there, there's the anxiety itself, but then there's also the message that I've given them that I don't know how to lead them well in this particular circumstance. And it's a scary thing. If you think about being a little kid, if you ever had a moment whenever you saw a parent fail to parent well, think about how like scary and overwhelming it is whenever that happens. Cause you're like, oh my gosh, like this is my person who's supposed to take care of me and, and show me where to go. And it doesn't seem like they know what to do. That's a very scary prospect. It's also scary like that on a team in the workplace. Um, so you give away that anxiety, it may, might, you might think it's going to make you feel better, but the, 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 the consequence is that the total anxiety in the system actually grows. Um, so, uh, so what do we do? Um, and this is another way to even think about executive presence is that, uh, uh someone who has very strong executive presence, um, is someone who can experience anxious moments, but can, uh, can process them within themselves. They can be self-contained and, uh, and can, can lean on their own resourced self to be able to think through the source of the anxiety, make wise decisions about how to move forward, and then can convey uh, those decisions and the implications of those decisions to their team. But even if in an anxious moment, you, you as the leader, you don't necessarily come up with a, a great idea for a path forward, it doesn't mean that your only option is now to dump the anxiety on the team because sometimes you won't know as the leader what to do. And that's part of what your team is there for. They're there to help you figure out what to do. Um, so another option too is if you do experience an anxious moment, if you can engage with your team around whatever that source of anxiety is, but you can do it in a way where, you, again, you're not throwing the anxiety onto the team, but instead you're the one who has thought through the situation um, you've identified, uh, you know, maybe a decision that needs to be made, or, you know, a, a solution that you're in need of, a set of circumstances that need to get sorted out. You don't necessarily know what to do, or maybe you have a sense of what you want to do, but you want to bring the, the, the thoughts that you have to your team, bringing those thoughts to the team in a way that does not convey uh, or offload the anxiety, but instead shows them that, hey, this is a tough set of circumstances, but look at me, look at my demeanor look at the way that I'm thinking, talking, and acting, um, you can tell that there's nothing to be worried about. And we're not here to have a conversation about what we need to be worried about. We're here to have a conversation about uh, coming up with a game plan to move forward. That's a great example, too, of how executive presence can be something that you can emit um, even when you are right in the middle of experiencing a high level of anxiety. So what we want to talk about in these next three uh, short circuits and the strategies to help you avoid or overcome the short circuit is we want to think about that impact of anxiety on the leader um, and uh, talk about how to uh, manage it in a way that helps us preserve and maybe even strengthen our executive presence rather than uh, eroding the executive presence. So here we go. Number one, talking over people. Now this is one that is a particular challenge for me personally. And part of it's because um, sometimes I will just get charged up uh, with an idea or a point um, or even kind of almost like a cause that I'm trying to advocate for. Um, and I just have a lot of energy. Uh, it feels right. So I kind of feel like I'm, you know, being like a little bit of a, almost like a freedom fighter. Um, and I'll just feel really, really compelled to, to make that point, uh, almost to the point where I will bowl over other people. Um, I'll, I'll fill up the space with my own words and won't give other people the chance to talk. Um, but even sometimes when other people are talking, I will very quickly uh, move to, to speak and I might accidentally cut someone off or by being the next one that speaks, I uh, take a turn that someone else in the room maybe would have had the opportunity to take um, and I, I talk over them. Uh, and it's not hard to, to probably hear in that description how part of what I'm describing is my own, uh, I'm connecting with my own anxiety in the way that I'm communicating. So I'm anxiously trying to get every, everything out um, on my end. Um, and for sure, one of the things that we can do that short circuit our ability to project the, the, the capabilities of a leader is to put our anxiety into the room or into the group or into the space versus putting our leadership there, uh, putting our, our strength, our poise, our assuredness, our steadiness, and our trustworthiness. Um, and yeah, talking over people, great way to slap your anxiety right there on the table. So what can we do as an alternative? Well, one suggestion is to make a plan to follow up. 
So, uh, and I want to talk with you a little bit about a practical way to do that. So if I go into a group setting, into a meeting, one of the things that I will try to do is to, to, before the meeting even starts, to just start with the mindset that I am going to be following up with at least someone in this room. I don't have to, everything that's going to happen in relation to the topic of conversation doesn't have to happen in this space during this meeting time. And so part of what I'll do is sometimes even uh, preemptively make a list of the names of the people in the room. Um, or if I don't do that ahead of time, as the meeting goes on, if someone says something and I feel like I have a point that I wanna make before I make the point in the room, I'll write their name down and write the point on my on my notebook. Um, so, you know, for example, um, you know, I might hear Mike say something that spurs a thought and it's something that I think I might want to respond to. So maybe Mike is talking about uh, the, the, the change in profitability for the last quarter. So I might do something like um, profit down for Q1 and um, just to make note of what it was that he said and maybe he made a point about why he thought that happened but I had some sort of a point that I thought was a counterpoint to that um, or, or just another thing to think about so maybe he thought um, it was because we spent too much on X but I was thinking like no maybe it's like a cyclical thing so maybe if that's that's the point that I want to make maybe I would just you know say is that cyclical So I make that note. So one of the things that I found, and this is true in a lot of uh, respects, not just in kind of like managing your own anxiety in a group setting, but the act of writing expends a little bit of anxious energy. Um, it's one of the things that's helpful about taking notes in a meeting um, is it's a way to kind of dissipate some of that, that anxious buildup. But just by doing this, some of that impulse that makes me feel like I need to talk over people gets kind of like calmed down by doing this. Um, I also have told myself that I don't have to say it in the meeting in, in order for it to get said or in order for it to be heard. Um, here's another thing, too, that's worth mentioning uh, in regard to this. Um, you've probably noticed this in your own experience, but people who are able to be engaged even outside of meetings um, project steadiness, uh, the ability to keep your eye on the ball, and those are people um, who, who other folks tend to respect. And in, in future conversations and meetings, people are going to naturally assume that you are prepared because they've seen you do follow-up work outside of meetings before uh, because they've maybe been the recipient of, a, of an email where you address this sort of a thing or you raise your, your concern after the meeting. And when that happens, they think, this guy is somebody who is dialed in and paying attention and who stays connected even when we're not in the space together. This is a careful thinker. This is someone who I should connect to. So not only does this pay dividends in terms of helping you manage your anxiety in the meeting time itself, but it also helps build your reputation as someone who's a steady person who will be reliable for future interactions. So that's one tip uh, to help you deal with uh, the, the, the urge or the impulse to talk over others. If that's something that you deal with, uh, one of the ways that you can address it is to come into the meeting with a plan to follow up. Number two, over explaining. So uh, imagine, if you will, um, two parents, two uh, different parents, um, both parents of an eight year old, okay? And uh, let's imagine that you're watching uh, these two parents explain something relatively simple to an eight year old. Um, and parent A explains the, the relatively simple thing to the eight year old, but in your judgment, when you're watching the, the explanation happen, the parent is talking to the eight-year-old, not like an eight-year-old, but maybe like a five-year-old. So they're talking to the eight-year-old in a way that's kind of like a little bit um, more elementary than is probably warranted given, you know, what an eight-year-old is capable of. So that's example A. Example B is a different parent talking to their eight-year-old about something, and they're explaining it. And maybe the eight-year-old isn't necessarily even picking up on everything uh, that the parent's talking about, but they're treating the eight-year-old maybe like a nine-year-old. They're maybe actually thinking like the eight-year-old's a little bit more with it than they actually are given their age, okay? So both of them are maybe missing it by a little bit, but one is talking down pretty aggressively, whereas the other one is maybe assuming some things uh, that the kid knows they don't. No, so think about those two examples. 
Now imagine those same two parents, but some time has passed and now they don't have an eight-year-old, they have a 28-year-old. And if you think about those two habits as something that has persisted over the upbringing of that child, how would you imagine the relationship of that parent to the 28-year-old in each of those two examples? Um, so if you are in a situation where you feel like you have noticed yourself over explaining sometimes, um, then I don't have kind of like a, 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 as much of a technique for how to kind of short circuit that behavior um, as, a, as a principle. And the principle is this, trust your audience. I think if you could try to cultivate the, uh, the, the consistent pattern of trusting your audience and of expecting them to be able to rise to the occasion, expecting that they can get stuff, that they'll understand stuff, that they care, that they're engaged, um, then you can be more like that parent who, if they do err, they may be err on the side of treating their eight-year-old like a nine-year-old. And if we think about like the long-term effects of over-explaining on the one hand versus trusting your audience on the other, I think that it's probably more likely that the parent of that 28-year-old um, has a, uh, a collegial uh, uh relationship that's characterized by like mutuality, by, by trust, um, by uh, a willingness to share responsibility, by an openness um, versus maybe a, a persistent feeling that you have to prove yourself. Um, and if we think about that in terms of one of the big goals of a leader, which uh, I would say that a, a big goal as a leader is to be able to uh, consistently get results from and through other people. Um, that's part of what we uh, uh, are hoping to be able to pull off as leaders. Um, and think about those two scenarios again. Which of the two parents do you think is more likely to be in a position when they, their child is a 28-year-old and is capable of doing some pretty big things? Which of those two parents is likely to be able to get big results from their very capable 28-year-old? Is it the one who's consistently taught that 28-year-old that they don't necessarily know how to expect the best from them? Um, and they might uh, overcomplicate, um, dumb down uh, things because they have expectations that that person's maybe not quite as capable as their age would really belie. Um, or do you think the person who consistently treated that child um, like, yeah, you, I know that you're capable and I know you're smart and I know you care. And therefore, I believe that you're going to be able to figure this out. Which of those two parents do you think will be able to get consistent, uh, high quality output, um, uh, in their relationship with their kid. It's probably the one who trusts the audience. So that's it. Number two, um, over explain good antidote to it. Trust your audience. Number three, the fingertip thing. So this little move right here with your hands, I remember like in the early days of the internet, um, seeing, you know, videos, articles that were talking about how to, how to, you know, be like a power player in whatever room you're in. And, uh, they'd always have tips about like what to say, how to say it, all that kind of stuff. But it seemed like almost always one of the things that came up was doing this little number or some variant of it with your hands. Um, and I feel like, you know, in the last 25, 30 years, I don't know how many times I've watched a movie or something like that, especially if it's like a courtroom movie where you have someone or like a boardroom scenario in a movie where you have somebody who's doing this, you know? And uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I will sometimes be in meetings with someone who's doing that. And I think that uh, in part because of like cultural fatigue, now this looks like a move that someone is making when they're trying to tell everybody, no, 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 I wanna be in charge. Or I think I'm in charge. You might think you're in charge, but I kind of think I'm in charge. But I think uh, in most cases, the signal that you send whenever you do this little number here, right here, is you are uh, you're, uh, inveying the, the, the assumption that you think you're superior to the people in the room. And also, this is like a cut yourself off from the crowd move, too. You know, it's like a, like a complicated physical barrier that you're putting up between uh, you and the rest of the folks in the room. So I think it's like... It's like an old fashioned sort of a, a, a thing that people see right through and don't value or they don't even notice it. So uh, what I would suggest you do as an alternative is angle toward. And what do I mean by that? So if you're in a room, if you're in like a boardroom situation or like a meeting room um, and you're speaking or someone else is speaking, if you're speaking, angle and lean in. 
And maybe if you're the if you're the speaker, think about who you want to connect with in the room and take the opportunity to to angle in to folks in the room uh, as you speak. Um, if you're not the speaker and someone else is speaking, you know, whenever that time comes, then the angle in option is also valid because you can angle into the person that is uh, speaking. Another thing that is helpful to think about with the angle in uh, idea is that sometimes when you're in a group setting and everybody's talking, um, you'll find that uh, some folks are getting drowned out. And one of the things that you can do to call out what's best in that person who's maybe not getting a chance for their voice to be heard is to point your angle in at them. And what's that, what that's doing is it's cueing that person that you would love to hear what they have to say, that you are the one who's actively including them in the group. And boy, what a great use of leadership to draw someone who's maybe feeling a little bit kind of like uh, silenced or quieted or, or like their opportunity to speak uh, has been taken away from them. If you can be the one that draws them back in, what a great expression of, of a leader's power uh, to be able to do something like that. So that's it. Maybe think about replacing this little move was something like this. All right, so there you have it. There's three tips uh, to help you cultivate executive presence by not uh, committing some of these short circuits. So the three short circuits we talked about, talking over people, so instead, plan to follow up. The second one, over explaining. Instead, trust your audience. The third one is a body language one, the fingertip thing. Instead, angle toward. Uh, those are our three short circuits. I would encourage you to just try to gather a little bit of awareness about these things when you're engaging with your own team and when you're just talking to people in general um, and think about using these tactics as a way to uh, to try to in intentionally present in a little bit more of a uh, relaxed, confident, capable in the driver's seat sort of a way. Um, also, the book, A Failure of Nerve by Edwin Friedman, I want to let you know that I did put a link to that in the description um, if that's a book that you're interested in, I would highly recommend it. And uh, I hope this helps you um, in your journey to grow uh, as a leader.